Hey everyone, it's Mind Rolling, Raghu. I am back, and I'm back with a good friend of my guru. Did you, <laughs> Aubrey Marcus, did you know about that, Aubrey? You're good friends with my guru, my podcast guru, Duncan Trussell. He's a, he's a guru to many of us, and a good friend of mine as well. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, God, he's something. So, Aubrey... Many of you, I'm sure, know about Aubrey. You, a Renaissance man would be a good description of Aubrey, right? You're an entrepreneur. I don't, know I, I don't even know if I can give a good description of Aubrey anymore these days. But no, <laughs> I think I'll, we'll do our best to to muddle our way through a, a description of of who and what I am. So. <laughs> whatever whatever you say fit i'll i'll agree you'll with you'll agree Rob. with it all okay well um in in reality i i don't know if you know much about be here now network and uh, this is one of the podcasts on that network and a lot of what we do is you know just giving people an opportunity to sh share some information that might help just day to day. And I know you you do a lot of that and in a very practical way and have some really great guests. So I think that there's a lot of uh, connectivity between uh, some of the things that are going on uh, from where you're at. But so where did, how did you just tell us a little bit about, really a little bit about how you not only just got into some of the things that you're doing, um, of course, what one of the things that Duncan and I are working on actually these days is around uh, a coined term from our friend Krishnadas called the movie of me. So we have mm. something going the movie of me to the movie of we is what we are, you know, we're trying to get to the core of. So when did you even realize there was a movie going on and maybe that wasn't exactly who you were? Well, I think it's a constant uh, awakening to a deeper level of which the movie is actually playing. You know, I think the first real awakening came from probably my first vision quest experience with uh, a shaman in the mountains when I was 18. And we did uh, some psilocybin and I felt my body somewhat evaporate in this essence which you could call consciousness or spirit or the unborn and the undying. I got to feel that myself for the first time it was nothing that i'd ever heard about or it was not part of my background or not part of my what my parents talked about or what what i really believed to be true but i experienced it there i was as something that could be described as awareness or consciousness or spirit again language always has connotations that are challenging but I felt that at 18, that was 20 years ago. And that was that first moment of realization that there was uh, deeper levels of complexity to this human experience. And um, it's been a steady process of awakening little bit by little bit and forgetting a little bit <laughs> and sometimes a lot um, as I've gone on. And uh, that's continued through many different plant medicine and experiential journeys from meditation to uh, yoga to floating to nature to you know all of the ways that you can slowly become aware of yourself and um, mm. all of the all of the distractions and all of the intoxications and all of the ways that we uh, we know to forget this truth uh, because we aren't quite ready to accept it. Yeah. Uh, well, that movie that we've been he and I have been talking about. Um, you wake up in the morning. And you are the protagonist, the lead actor. You're maybe even the supporting actors as well. The director, the producer of this constant reference to the me that we attach to ourselves based on whatever, habitual patterns and roles and identities and all of that. And then just go through the day without many as a time that there is absolutely no awareness whatsoever of the uh, the motivations that are driving this me, that are setting this mm. me up, that are uh, the, the ways in which we actually build this so that it suits getting what we want. Right? 
So, yeah, and I know you've talked to people about this kind of a thing. Yeah, I mean, what what are the things that you talk about with people in terms of uh, recognize just getting into a recognition of that? Because without that, without that awareness, very difficult to you know go to day to day. Awareness is the tool by which you can advance all progress on the in the spiritual dimension in the true you know recognition of who you are. And without that awareness, you're really actually watching a movie rather than playing as the role in the movie and and that awareness includes yourself as protagonist and antagonist right the the force of yes the force of acceptance and surrender and then the force of resistance and denial and if you're not really tuned in and aware of these processes that are happening then the movie is being played on you rather than you playing and writing the movie yourself and uh it, it's it's interesting you know it's it's very interesting and you caught me in a very interesting place where i had a you know a lot of revelation that's been happening in the last two weeks and uh, an even deeper understanding of how much i've been driven by certain tendencies and certain addictions to validation and certain insecurities and certain ways in which my identity self wanted to claim and support itself you know that i was you know continually sleeping <laughs> on you know i okay i'm i'm in the same boat with you all right so we're going <laughs> to share these things okay Aubrey. i have in the last couple of weeks myself and you know and i'm a little older than you and so decades at this stuff since i was in india with with ramdas who I'm, i know you know Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I suddenly saw the like extraordinary detail of the projections that in a situation that I had going, I was projecting on so much stuff about, and I could, I could actually, it was like slow motion, you know, like a, a ball being thrown slow and you see it in slow motion. And I could see this that I built these projections about what this person was, who this person was, and what I had done was completely to accomplish the manipulation of getting what I wanted. It was in <laughs> such day glow, I can't even tell you. So I don't know, yeah. what was yours? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's the... <laughs> that's a, a good synopsis of how it goes i mean it, it seems to be universal and that's the thing that you find is these things that we think are very personal and very individual are actually very collective and very universal and um so for me it's just understanding you know in intrapersonal relationships particularly those romantic relationships like what i was seeking and why i was seeking it and then how much that I was trying to validate and substantiate my own worthiness of love, my own self-love through the reflection in other people's eyes or perhaps between other people's legs or whatever way that I wanted to look at the mirror, looking back at myself to show myself that I was worthy of love. And you start to become aware of that or perhaps deny the love that you are and your expression of love by turning away averting your eyes averting your eyes to the truth of who you are and so it's this balance of recognizing when you're chasing chasing a reflection when you're projecting yourself to receive something back in return or when you're actually shutting your eyes and closing your ears and doing that kind of la 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 you know i'm not seeing i can't see anything um and really trying to become more and more aware of that and it's it's difficult to reconcile those truths with the you know the lives that we live the things that we do the running of a company the the all of the day-to-day -day practices that you know we are in this world of the polarity actually so we're you know in this balance and in this tension which doesn't have to be a negative tension but just the natural tension like the dancing of the tango of spirit and form that are kind of keeping the tension so that we can dance through this existence hopefully with grace typically i do it like a clumsy 
you know, one footed bull who's hopping around and falling <laughs> a lot, but <laughs> eventually there's a, there ends to be a little bit of a grace to the dance. Yeah. And a little bit of, oh yes, we're human. It's okay. <laughs> this yes, is uh, Jack Cornfield, if you know who Jack is, uh, his, mm -hmm. his real, his basic thing. It's okay. Look at this weird shit we got going. We got to, we eat, put this stuff in this hole in our face. Yeah. I mean, what, you know, and sex. Have you ever watched yourself having sex? That's, of course, the line. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, one thing that you said was when you really, like we were, we were doing a little bit of comparing having a personal experience where this stuff was shone back in our faces about uh, this desire system or this projection system wanting to manipulate the universe and your world just to get more comfy and get what you want. And so, and then you start to look around and you realize everybody's doing it. Everyone mm. has, and basically the same shit. I'll tell you a story, which I've told on this podcast before, but it's so great. Everybody, you got to hear it again. Um, I was in India back in the day with Ram Das, and we ended up in, in this beautiful spot in the Himalayas looking. I mean, the whole horizon was 27, 8,000 foot mm. mountains, tree shul, Shiva's mount. I mean, it was just extraordinary. And we were there, and we were doing a, a meditation practice and so on. And because Ramdas is Ramdas, and he had been a psychologist, he offered, and this is something he did, you come and you sit, just like we're sitting, except by video chat. And he would say, eye to eye, whatever it is that you can't tell anybody, tell me now. Okay? So you can imagine the... <laughs> that came out <laughs> of each person. Now, we were in India, so you could hear everything on every side of every room as if you were in that room because there's no insulation, there's no nothing. Hmm. So everybody, uh, so the people up and down and across whatever from Ram Dass's room heard everybody's spiel and it was all the same. It was all around sex. Everybody's thing with some kind of sex <laughs> fuck up, okay? And and then and then we all knew that. It, eventually, we were in this crazy place of like letting everything go. You know, of course, we had been with the, our guru Neem Karoli Baba, so that that was a whole other reality that was set in place in terms of how who were, how we were relating with each other was way different than before we had gotten there. That's for sure. But everybody, yeah. But it was so great. We're all in the same boat. It's okay. We're all, mm -hmm. I mean, us Westerners, sex is, is a real issue, okay? So mm -hmm. it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> and that was a big deal, yeah. Yeah, it's important to remember. You know, I had a, <clears throat> in, a in a medicine journey with, uh, I was working actually one-on-one -on -one with the maestro, and he uh, he could sing Icaros, and the Icaros are medicine songs that call in certain energies. And he actually called, uh, called for the Christ energy to come enter the room and the spirit of Christ consciousness. And um, I had had no experience with that. You know, I'm not a religious man by any means, although, you know, obviously I'd been on the spiritual path for some time. What's and the difference, by the way, before you, I want to hear the story, but well, for you, religion spirituality to me is and religion. The, religion to me is the codification of the ineffable. You know, it's the... Um, it's the set of rules and the set of language that describes the truth, which is really beyond language. Um, and it can be manipulated by the words and the understandings of human beings to get what human beings want in, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, and I think uh, I heard uh, my, one of my mentors, Paul Selig, he, he's described religion as um diamonds of truth poured in a mortar of distortion you know yeah. in that mortar like that. <laughs> and uh and and really so to me the uh, trying to get to the essence of the diamonds without the mortar of the distortion that goes with it and that's what spirituality is to me but anyway so the christ consciousness archetype if you will it's just a name <clears throat> but it arrived into the room and and um 
I could visualize it as a column of emerald light. It didn't come in human form, anthropomorphized like we like to have things. Uh, but it came as a column of emerald light. And the message was, you know, show me your very worst. Show me that thing that you're the most ashamed mm. of. Show me that thing that is the absolute most despicable aspect of yourself. Show it to me and you will see that I do not flinch that my love does not waver, that my love holds no record of wrong, and that I love you all the same. Like there won't even be a little, ooh, wow. You know, there's none of that. You know, it's just a steady presence of love and acceptance and forgiveness beyond even forgiveness, which is usually you think you have to ask for forgiveness. It was pre-forgiveness. It was not even registering a record of wrong. Like that was the force that was in the room. And that's a really recalibrating thing to understand that's a wild understatement are you kidding that is unbelievable <laughs> it's it's un unconditional love so so basically you have this experience i had the mm -hmm. same experience with this being and everybody else ramdas and so on but as ramdas tells the story when he first met him uh guru his guru nim karoli baba told him everything that had happened to him two, three nights earlier when he went out to take a pee, he was thinking about his mother, all of a sudden looking at the stars, and he said, oh, you're out, so he tells him, you're out there thinking about your mother, and the stars, you're in blah, blah, and Ram Dass goes, yeah, and he was like, you know, completely straight, right? I mean, except for all the psychedelics he had done, but he, <laughs> he was not into Hinduism, he was into Buddhism, and he was like, he felt that this whole thing was schlocky, you know, somebody, Bhagavan Dass took him up to see this, you know, in the middle of nowhere in the Himalaya. So he said, yeah. And then he said, so she died. Spleen got big. She died of spleen. She, she died of spleen cancer. At that point, he, that he, he couldn't calibrate that. So poop. Mm. And the next thought he had, holy shit. If he knows that, he knows all the bullshit that yeah. I don't want anybody to know. And then he looked up and this is his famous story. And, and, Maharaji, as we called him, was just sitting there completely exactly what you just described in in that room with that light of what that was, of Christ consciousness, total forgiveness, total love, total acceptance, total absolute absolute in that moment. And anyhow, Ramdas came back, he wrote Be Here Now from that <laughs> the rest <laughs> is history. Oh, man. Oh, wow. You know, it's it's funny because, you know, I'll have these experiences and then um, it's like I'll, I'll, I'll understand their truth because their truth is undeniable. I was there. I felt it. I understood it. But it's it's almost overloads the it overloads the system and then the, the ego identification form will resist against it. Find some way to just put it aside. Let's just, let's just cast that aside or, or, or tell the story that it's not possible to be that, that it's not po like, and, and I think in some ways, yes, we are human and acknowledging our humanness. It's all part of that thing, but um, it, it's really difficult to truly accept, truly accept the divinity and the love and that unconditional love and that experience. It's all, Hard thing. It's a hard thing to really actually take in into your knowing, and uh, and I think that's the kind of the place that I'm at, where it's I keep finding this space, and it's getting to the point where I I'm not I'm less able to put it in a little box and like say oh yeah I, I know that thing I can talk about it but I'm not going to be it you know I'm just going to talk about it. I'm just going to tell you stories, mm. but it's getting harder for me to do that to like put it aside and just tell the stories about it without actually embodying I totally get it i totally get it <laughs> and it's like you, you know in uh, it's just yeah you forget and you wake up you forget and you wake up basically that's that's all there mm -hmm. is to it and that's why uh i don't know if you practice uh, everybody out there we just met so we're just getting to know each other here uh but meditation is very uh mm -hmm. essential and uh in being able to uh, to have a leverage into the belief in the me in the story every all these stories that we create yeah that's like i can't be that no way that's like somewhere <laughs> out there man. you know and if i be that how can i run my company how can i do this how can i have, you know so yeah. whatever that is 
and uh, so the 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 leverage is in in my mind uh, meditation. I bugged Duncan for years about meditation, <laughs> and he was always like. No, I can't do it. My mind is too crazy. I go, everybody's mind's too crazy. That's not a reality. <laughs> and he's been doing it with David Nichter, and he's, does, he's doing this stuff with uh, David, who's a great Buddhist teacher uh, uh -huh. and a great music producer, too. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. At, at some point, yeah. we just you can't any longer hold back the... the, the 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 dikes it's no it's not going to work you know and you just yeah. that's the letting letting go process but um the the meditation i i have a great quote that i from a friend of mine the impacts of meditation are not better health or sharper business performance because that's the whole thing with mindfulness they say the big mindfulness thing mm. but mm -hmm. rather a further reach towards our better nature. A friend mm -hmm. of mine named Danny Goldman, who wrote a great book, by the way, called Emotional Intelligence. Have you ever heard about that That book? I have, yeah. Yeah, yeah wonderful book. And he was w one of us uh, that was in India back in that day. Yeah. D meditation, that ring a bell for you? 100%. I mean, I think we give shiny lures to lure people onto something that's uh, that's really for a different purpose. So like we'll tell people to be mindful because we'll show them the health benefits because people care about their health or people care about their sleep or people care about their business or people care about that. But that's really not what it's ultimately for. It's like encouraging people to do yoga so they're more flexible. <laughs> yes, yoga will make you more flexible, but it's not the purpose of yoga. Really. And if you do it long, if you start to secretly, you know, understand the purpose of yoga, or at least, or maybe you don't, or maybe you just do it for the stretching and that's okay too. And maybe you do the meditation just for a little more clarity in your, you know, entrepreneurial life or, you know, a little escape, but the, what it really is and what its potential really is might be something, you know, much different, you know, and I think that's not only with meditation, it's with everything with like plant medicine. There's so many people who you know, want to talk about whether doing a plant medicine or psychedelic journey will help you as an entrepreneur, you know, and like, yes, effect, you know, perhaps, but like, that's not the, that's not the real point of it. The point of is it to go deep into the shadows of your own heart and psyche and spirit and start to understand you and the nature of the universe, which might help your business, but <laughs> that's not really what the point of it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's a difficult journey these days. Seems to be getting more difficult every day with the gigantic polarization. And you start to think, I'm in that, boy, I'm right there. I'm right there with tossing shit over the fence at the other side. I'm right there in the, uh, you know, the darkness of the moment. Like, you know, the other day, <laughs> this report comes out, all, all the whole left is completely now destroyed, right? Uh, because because of this complete exoneration, it seems, of of uh, our president. So mm. uh, yeah, so getting to the we. What do you think about getting to the we? Well, I think you have to feel the we before you can even try to get to the we, and that's I think the that's I think the challenge. Like, there's a lot of people that can talk about moving from me to we as we are here. But until you've experienced what the we is like and you feel how true it is, and, and maybe not only just experiencing it once, but maybe you have to at least once is at least once is a good start. But then like experiencing it and re-experiencing it and re-experiencing it until, as like I was saying earlier, you can no longer deny it. Then at that point, you know, you really understand that, all right, we can call things right, or we can call things left, or we can call things up, or we can call things down. But really what we, what is true is that in my understanding that, you know, all is of source or nothing is, but all and nothing is also the same thing. So all really all is of source, all is of same, all is of that, that initial arc of energy love light unicity that came from that point where the universe was a thumbnail compressed into the infinite potential of all universes that would come and then 
burst out forward into the differentiation. Like that is the real ultimate we. It's not just my tribe or the people who believe like me. It's right and left. It's everything. It's all of us are we. And if that's the case, then what should we be worried about? Well, probably we should be worried about like taking care of our home and whether or not an asteroid is going to come wipe out all the opportunities for us to play this game in polarity on this beautiful playing ground called Earth. Mm. <laughs> Where's the asteroid? Is the asteroid coming? I didn't know that. I don't know, but I mean, <laughs> what else? What else are we worried about, right? Like, take care of the environment, take care of each other, take care of the animals, take care of the ecosystem, and make sure a giant rock from outer space doesn't collide and end the game. All right. Well, I'm I'm in my little mini me part right now, going. Uh, t- getting back to the other tribe, I'm having trouble myself th- being able to sit down with the with someone from the other tribe. I don't know. Have you sat down with somebody from the other tribe and they have said whatever they have said and you've watched your reactions and watch your judgments? And I'm more concerned about that in me, that polarization that I am about the asteroid. I got to tell you. Well, Yeah. I mean, I think that's I think that's a, a wise place to start, right? Start at home, you know, start right here with yourself, you know, like that's a that's the most important place that we can actually do the work. I mean, I was hypothesizing a place where everybody's already done their work and we all have that understanding <laughs> and we're all seeing the same thing. And then we all cumulate, uh, like, so communally wanna... start worrying about the asteroids. But for now, yeah, let's worry about that ourselves. Let's try to see that whatever trump supporter or that radical left supporter or whatever whatever the thing is that challenges you or triggers you let's try to see that person with love without judgment without holding a record of wrong see the truth of who they are beneath all of the surface expression and let's practice that first you know i mean i think that's that's just wisdom yeah back to meditation yeah everything points for me it points back to meditation and uh it, it it cultivates the holistic qualities like attention, mindfulness, right perspective, right meditation, uh, empathy, compassion. I mean, those are the things that uh, are the biggest cultivation that we can do for the planet <clears throat> if we can get that really going within ourselves. So that's why um, there was a... Uh, the, this same friend of mine, Danny Goldman, wrote a book with uh, a man named Richie Davidson called Altered Traits. And uh, it's how science reveals how meditation meditation changes your mind, brain, and body. They proved it. They are now proving it. I mean, they they've got really great equipment now that measures brain patterns and so on. So uh, it's it's a pretty amazing book, actually. Uh, by the way, let's remember to get that book up on our show notes. Everybody, you'll have a way to get that book. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I'd love um, to read it. Yeah. Um, attention, uh, that's something else in, in terms of, for me, getting to the we, aside from everything we've been talking about, uh, is to watch our attention and, and I, and with attention, I kind of mean two different things. One being attentive and you talked about awareness, you know, and we both agree how extraordinarily important awareness is and but the attention that you give to somebody else, right? I think that that uh, goes a long way to breaking down uh, molds and projections of other people that we have. Uh, if we drop into a place where a, a little bit, of, as much as we can get into a no-mind place and being at- uh, attentive to another person. What's, what's your experience, Aubrey, around that attention? Well, I think there's different ways that you can pay attention. You know, you can pay attention to the part of that person that aggravates you, or you can pay attention to the part of them that is the same as you and is maybe been molded by their environment, maybe has their own anger and protection mechanisms and their own projections. So so I think it's not only attention, but it's what you're paying attention to. And, um, and what you're choosing to, to see what, and what you see, um, you know, like that, I think seeing is really, uh, in some ways a choice once you cultivate that level 
to really see, all right, am I seeing the thing that's disagreeable? And am I, am I seeing the thing that's going to evoke the most judgment from me? Or am I seeing the thing that actually bridges the gap between us? And, um, and that's the, you know, that's the challenge. You know, I know in, in some of the meditation practices, like loving kindness meditation, you start with hmm. loving those that are easy for you to love. Oh, okay. It's easy for me to love my dog. It's easy for me to love my wife. It's easy for me to love my best friend. It's easy for me to love my mentor. But all right, now let's go and let me see if I can love and see the one that it's hardest for me to love. And that's where the stretch comes from. And that's where the challenge comes from is to see the, the universality even in, you know, what on some octave of expression might be considered your rival or your enemy. Like, can you see them as, as same? And can you see them as self too? And can you give that attention? You know, that's, that's interesting and a lot, a lot more difficult than not something that I'm very good at either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, none of us are good that the whole thing is in the by the it's just in the doing you have the intention right we have the intention to connect with that the true part of ourselves which already completely is in tune with the we and understands that so you just got to keep going back you know and that's what uh, and that's why meditation is great especially if you if even you just start focusing on one object right i mean i do vipassana meditation insight mm-hmm. meditation and it's around the breath just watching the breath going in and out or at the or at the abdomen up and down and getting to a uh, uh, you know it takes a while to get to a one pointed place where your discursive th- thought just goes down and things slow down enough so that something else can happen and that becomes uh, it's an, an an analogy it's an analogy for our day to day lives when shit comes up of losing it and then it's okay go back go back to mm. the breath and it's you know and in many cases it's very useful to use the breath when you've completely freaked out like i did <laughs> on dtv guy the other day on the phone he got me <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. oh screaming this is absolutely incorrect what the fuck is wrong with you i did that <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah so i needed a few huge breaths to come back from that one but um yeah but and the other attention that i i I think you know given my knowledge of course of of the different things that you've been involved with and certainly relationships has been a big deal for you and you you Mm -hmm. are obviously using that as as a method to really get as straight as you can around this stuff uh, mm-hmm. uh, and I know that, uh, and by the way, I can barely handle my own consciousness, never mind my wife's <laughs> and, and anybody <laughs> else's, I'll tell you that. Um, but the, the, also just the thing, you know, people, the best thing I read, somebody said this, the, the most generous thing that you can do for another person is completely be there in the moment for them in terms of attention. You, giving your entire self up to be there for whatever that person n- needs to talk to you about, let's just say, in the moment, and be there. It's what happened to me. It's what, everything that I have gotten this whole time from that time I was in India all those years ago stemmed from because Ramdas gave me that attention when I first met him. I opened a door. I was a, I was a program director of a radio station. It all found me. <laughs> and... And I opened the door. He was in Montreal, where, where I'm from and where this was. And, and I had never been given that kind of attention before. Okay? I don't care. Maybe as a baby from my mother, who I didn't remember, but I doubt it. Because it was, but this moment was complete envelopment and attention from somebody. Like, he, came, he cared more about me than anything else possible in the universe. And that, he was able to drop everything in that moment. And... That kind of attention, have you found that kind of attention and the importance of it in interpersonal relations? <laughs> those moments are incredibly special. Those are the most special moments. Mm. You know, I mean, those are the moments that they're unfortunately infrequent enough that when they happen, I usually weep. I usually cry. I usually find tears flooding my eyes when 
those moments arrive because, and it's not the, anybody else around me's fault. It's mine as well, because oftentimes my attention is so partially focused on my own thoughts and my own desires and my own projections and my own little seductions and my own little um, preparations and masks and all of these things that I do that I'm not able to give nor receive that level of attention. But when you do find those states of attention, it's just, it's love. And that love is so, it's so visceral and palpable um, that it's, it's almost overwhelming. And, uh, and I've been able to find that more frequently. And, and also now know that that's the that's kind of the guide star you know there's lots of other levels of attention there's sexual attention and social attention and you know influence attention and these things but that real genuine love like that's the that's the most important part and starting to orient my relationships towards the actualization of that um is now the process that i'm heading uh towards somewhat clumsily at times but um, certainly trying to create that that level of capital L love attention in you know in the intimate circle of those around me, male and female both, but particularly it gets challenging with the female uh, you know the, the lovers around me because there's more lust and motivation and desire for for preference and pleasure oh. and these different things you know oh God, God bless you, Aubrey. <laughs> I just, it's so <laughs> daunting just even hearing about it. I, um, and the, uh, the symbolic meaning of eye contact, of putting aside what we are doing to connect, lies in the respect, care, and love it indicates. It's also from my friend Danny. I thought that was just a really good, uh, good little... Uh, can you do you mind? I mean, I'm sorry for the listeners who are really good at listening it to one thing <laughs> once, but could you say that again? Yep. The symbolic meaning of eye contact, of putting aside what we are doing, whatever we're doing in the moment, to connect, it lies in the respect, care, and love that it indicates, that that contact indicates. Yeah. I just like respect, care, and love. You know, I love simple, down-to-earth words that connect with the reality of our human thing. You know, and we can understand. I mean, in in and as you said earlier, talking about religion making you know words uh, meaning out of the ineffable, of course, and and in all ways that's true. But uh, th this is what I think is most uh, helpful for us mm. to understand in that just caring you know that's why i love his holiness right his holiness talks about my only religion is kindness mm. you know and uh and there was another great quote from here oh geez i don't know if i can find it uh that um just m m anything that we get from being conscious being aware doing practices it's it it's not about getting more power spiritual power worldly power it's about being more kind more caring and more loving that's the, the that's the only goal that's why we're here you know the whole nine yards and mm. uh yeah i just think that that's you know super important um, and it's also an opportunity to reflect and, and recognize that most of us who are hearing this, myself included, can look back at a litany of examples of which we haven't done that, where we've brushed off someone's eye contact, where we haven't mm, really paid attention, uh, where we haven't been kind, where we haven't been time. loving. Oh, where we haven't, and, and, and you don't have to go back long into your history. You could probably go back to earlier today, you know, yeah, wherever you yeah, are. Yeah. And I certainly can. And, and, uh, and, the faster you can forgive yourself, the quicker you can learn to reorient yourself towards those more important goals. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, boy. Um, let's see. I also, um, 
I think a big deal in all of this, you know, just again, I'm back to our, our theme, my theme with Mr. Trussell, hmm. the movie of me to the movie of we. And I think another ingredient that's absolutely necessary, and it's, it's to me part of the whole thing we were talking about, awareness, honesty, self-honesty. Talk about self-honesty. I mean, to me, that's just, nothing can happen without that. Well, self-honesty has to <clears throat> come from a level of awareness. And so, and being really aware of what's happening within yourself. Because otherwise, you're not even going to be aware that you're being dishonest because you're deluded and you're clouded from the vision that would actually allow you to be honest. So what are the things that cloud your vision? Well, shame is a big one. You know, if you're ashamed of aspects of yourself, you won't look at them. And shame comes from feeling guilt, feeling like you should be better, feeling like you should be more or different or a different way. And if you have this shame, you actually won't even be able to see the truth of what is because the shame will prevent it. The shame is like a layer of clouds. So you have to know that whatever you see that you can forgive, just as that column of emerald light is without a flinch, you can be that column of emerald light and forgive yourself and all of your past transgressions and hold no record of wrong, hold no grievance so that you can actually look. And then you have to actually, so that's one element. And then the other is adopt the perspective of watcher, the one that is aware, the, the consciousness that's aware of all things happening rather than the mind that's generating its own reality. So you have to shift your perspective, you have to eliminate the shame, and then you have to really have the courage to, you know, see what the ramifications of, you know, this new discovery, this new illumination of self mm -hmm might be and who you need to say sorry to who you need to say thank you to what you need to change about your life and your diet or your practices or your or anything else to really be in accord with it and sometimes it's radical and and sometimes these awakenings happen abruptly and sometimes they happen you know very gradually and um that's <laughs> that's that just seems to be the nature of it but yeah self-honesty is the most important tool and uh, and in order to do that we have to actually cultivate forgiveness cultivate forgiveness yeah yeah so uh by the way i have no idea why altered traits came up and i'm i was thinking about you and this book was not far from me and i started looking through and i thought there's some great things here to talk with uh, about with uh, with Aubrey, I don't know why. It's it's like uh, you, you, now you're going to have to get this book, Aubrey. You're gonna okay. Have to read this book, uh, but in in it because we're talking about awareness, and they have a a, a great uh, concept, um, meta awareness. So taking awareness and then going out, meta awareness. It, um, it doesn't matter what the supposed object of where of awareness might be but rather that we recognize awareness itself. That's something for everybody to chew on. Usually what mm -hmm. we perceive is a figure with awareness in the background. Meta-awareness switches figure and ground in our perception. So awareness itself becomes foremost. Okay, that... you. Uh, I'm going to make sure this is in the old show notes too, because you can read that a dozen mm. times and get more out of it e each time. Wow. Such awareness of awareness l itself lets us monitor our mind without being swept away by the thoughts and feelings we are noticing. That is huge, right? That's really what it's all about. And here's a quote from a, a, a guy named Sam Harris. That which is aware of sadness is not sad. That which is aware of fear is not fearful. The moment I am lost in thought, however, I am as confused as anyone else. Is that cool? Yeah, and true. <clears throat> and so true. I mean, I, I think one of my uh, one of my mentors is a, a man named Ted Decker, and he's always talked about the practice of when he's angry or when he's upset, he projects himself outside of that state and as the observer of himself, his name is Ted, he'll say, oh, look, 
Isn't that interesting that Ted is sad today? Isn't that interesting that Ted is angry today? <laughs> you know, uh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. You know, and and at that point, you, it gives yourself some space so that the emotion isn't overwhelming, because uh, that's what the emotion tries to do. The emotion will consume all of your awareness into and focus it into your mind and out of your heart and out of your spirit and it will kind of narrow your perceptions to the point where you're no longer aware of the emotion. You just are the emotion. You are anger. You are sadness rather than the one who is experiencing and witnessing this anger and the sadness. And it's a, uh, it's a slippery, it's a slippery little, little trap that happens within the body. And, um, and I think the more we can practice that, the better off we'll be and the less collateral damage it will create. You know, I mean, I can think back to, recent times of anger and, and understanding that, wow, why did, why did that anger come up and how was I not able to separate myself enough to actually see it? Well, the anger came because I perhaps didn't have the courage to express myself or stand up for myself or I was afraid or I didn't, you know, and it came up to give me the courage but I thought that I was that, but I'm really not that. I could have been aware like, oh, anger is coming up to give me the courage to say this thing, but I don't need to say it with the anger. I can remove myself from it, allow the signal to register, but then express without that caustic, acidic <laughs> form of acid that burns not only me, but those who actually receive it on the other side. Yeah. I'm with you, boy. It's it's been my <laughs> Achilles for most of my life. I talk about anger a lot with people on the podcast, and uh, yeah, that that's a it's a toughie because there's power in anger, and and so there's a way it feeds that story so big time and violently at times. And it's interesting because mm. anger can be used. The, 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 the Buddhists, some of the Buddhists say anger is a good thing, can be used constructively, especially in social action, but not if you're attached to it, which is what we're, you were just talking about. And mm. uh, same as, okay, get up next to whatever that emotion is and make friends with it and be with it instead of it being an object that mm. you're trying to get away from or whatever. So, um, yeah, anger, The I find myself with, I, I, it gets really, sometimes really cool. I can actually, the thing goes, rises up, right? Somebody says something to you, right? And mostly in relationships, I found them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And they say something and you get triggered and you, and you feel the thing, it starts to rise up. You know, and it's like a cobra that's right in front of you, and you know it's going to bite you right in the neck, and and that meaning that you are going to let go, let go, no mind, no nothing, just let go and indulge all of this power into this mini me bullshit of <laughs> of just running from something or fear or or you know every gamut of every emotion that happens usually in, in between people um and you know i see that there's an enjoyment there's something in i as it rises mm. like yeah yeah you know there's a something there it's insane right i mean i don't know what you it is well it, it's creating this endogenous drug cocktail that is like uh it's a drug you know, it's a, it's a drug ride and it feels, you know, it feels like you've just taken a real, a drug that made you incredibly powerful, almost invincible, willing to, to, you know, do anything, afraid of nothing, you know, and at that moment, and I think that was probably the original purpose of anger is to give courage, you know, at certain levels where we would have been afraid and would have been disadvantageous to human survival. But it's now we play it out in our own ego dramas and our own identity dramas rather than in that moment where you need to perhaps, you know, fight the, you know, wild saber toothed tiger away from your camp. You know, like that's you got a tiger. Where the... I got a big cobra. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 
I don't think we would continue to indulge something if there wasn't some reward. And I think the reward is that drug, uh, that drug that comes from all of those internal endogenous chemicals and hormones being released. Yeah. It's tough being human, isn't it? I mean, it really is. It's like, who invented this shit? Why can't it? It's tough, but it's beautiful. It's <laughs> tough as shit, but it's beautiful too, you know? Like, ultimately, ultimately, it's it's uh, it's the toughest, best ride that we could ever come up with. Yeah, well, and I was told by a Tibetan Lama back in the day, uh, Kalu Rinpoche, one of the great Lamas, uh, and he said, look, take care of your body. You do not. You can only become realized in a human body, not on any of these other planes of consciousness. Only in a human body can you actually become completely realized. So better take care, and you don't get them that often. He said, "Take care <laughs> of that body." You know, he really. You know, I was like twenty-four years old. Where you know, who thinks of doing, taking care of anything like that at that stage? You mm-hmm. know. But I'll never forget that. And, you know, now that I'm older, I realize the veracity of that. Oh, Jesus. No, ain't much time. You know, oh, yeah, take care of that body. Um, and why? And, why? But why is why is that? Why can we only be realized in a human body? I agree with the sentiment, take care of the human body. I think that's really important and, and something that we can all bring an immense amount of awareness to. But, but what is the... What is the kind of understanding that you, we can only be realized in a body? Now, here's where we go. I didn't ask. I didn't ask. <laughs> I didn't ask. I, I like. I was like. I knew who. I anything you say. I mean, it's got to be true. How the fuck would I know? I could never even. <laughs> and I don't even really want to know how you came to this thing or how you know this thing. I right. know you know it was that kind of a thing. But you know what I think? I think that. Um, only on this plane do we have the 10,000 beautiful visions, the 10,000 horrible visions. We have joy, we have pain, we have suffering. We have all of the makings of the thing to transcend. I think that must be that on the other planes, like you can go, if you go to a hell realm, you're just in hell. Then you go to heaven realm, you're just la la <laughs> all the time. Mm. Mm. Right. I mean, this is crude. And by the way, I do not know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> All right. I believe Kalu Rinpoche. I'm good at that. You know, I'm good at that. Yeah. I'm good at like, okay. <laughs> I saw Neem Karoli Baba. I knew absolutely as soon as the second I saw him, okay, there's no duality going on in this thing. I've never seen, it's like a computer. I never see anything like it. It, mm. And I absolutely, and you know, Ram Dass, all of us, we, we knew and that, was just self-evident and how did we get in front of that thing we didn't know that and uh and it was like that so i you know trust that's another thing trust that's a huge thing for me aubrey i mean when i when i talked about that attention with ramdas where he just left everything else behind and just was with me in that moment so that caused me to have trust i trusted implicitly whatever he was saying and who he was as a as a human and of course i i trusted it so much i went to india you know out of the middle of nowhere i quit this fantastic i was a program director of a major rock and roll station right gone (laughs) india yeah i gotta find this thing too you found this i want this thing whatever it is i had no idea what it is except i trust it so in your life trust what has that been a factor for you in uh i mean i mean am i human yeah of course (laughs) you know i mean i think uh trust faith you know these things even though we've been it's been proven a thousand times before and that in hindsight you can be grateful for everything and then you can realize that it all worked out as it should and all of these other things to trust that the next thing won't be the thing that totally disrupts the apple cart and ruins it all and fucks it all up i mean Every day you work on those, you know, choosing faith over fear, choosing trust over doubt. You know, I mean, this is, uh, again, one of those daily, daily practices. Yeah. But I also think in terms, and you've talked about mentors for yourself, and I've talked about these, uh, my guru and other lamas that I've met and so on, and and having that kind of trust. And I, I, I guess I talk about it, you know, we do these retreats in Maui, 
with Ram Das, Christian Das, and Buddhist teachers, uh, Sharon Sol. By the way, Sharon Sol. By the way, Sharon Salzberg's. You talked about. I think one of your mentors saying, uh, saying to himself, "Okay, here we are. We're going to have some fear here for a while." You know, having that kind of rapport mm. with the bullshit. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Sharon's got an. She she put a name to that person that runs into those <laughs> issues, Lucy. From you know, from the cartoon Peanuts, so she's Lucy. Yeah. So we, all, yeah, I'm trying. I'm still trying to figure out what my name could be. Uh, it's probably easy for me. I can just use my English. You know, the name that I was born with, which is Mitchell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's too bad. Um, but um, yeah, um, it just boils down. You know, this whole thing comes full circle for me in. Um, the experience that you related of that ay ayahuasca ceremony, I believe, with Christ consciousness experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, that's real. I mean, you have a lot of people that are listening to your podcast, I know. And I know you are talking about these experiences that you're having. You know, one thing that's so great about what you're doing is you're really being very honest, like Duncan. It's just wonderful, wonderful uh, stuff. And um, so people are going, wow, okay, that's real. That light came in and, and had Aubrey had this experience. That's real. I'm, I'm not, you know, in that moment, that person is like 2%, 5%, 10% more open. Heart is opened up a little bit so that that grace can come in either through ayahuasca ceremony, through listening a piece of music, going to an Indian meeting, blah, blah, whatever. There's a billion ways for that grace to happen uh, as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, and opening up to trust, that's why, that's why I think it means so much to me because I've been in, in the work I've been doing in the last number of years, that comes up a lot. You know, and it's a lot of, okay, you went to India, you met this being, blah, 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 very good for you, what about me? which Duncan was into, in, you know, in, in the very beginning. And, uh, and then there was a certain amount of trust to stay open rather than close down. I think that's really what, th what the biggest deal is. Yeah. Right? Stay open, no, many, no matter how many times you've gotten knocked down, no matter how many times it's hurt, no matter how many times, you know, you felt the pain, just open the flower back up. Yeah. And uh, that's the, yeah, that's the over overriding theme is just keep opening the flower back up with forgiveness and with trust and love and faith. Perfect. We shall end right there. That's beautiful. All right. Thank you so much, Aubrey, for coming. Yeah, and, and, I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, enjoyed meeting you as well. And yeah. uh, one of these times, you're you're in Los Angeles, right? I'm in Austin, Texas, but I'm in L.A. a lot. So. Oh, you are? You go back and forth a little bit. Okay, so one... Uh, I'm I'm there a lot too, and one of these days, I'd love we'll hang out and we'll meet up with Duncan, have some. Fun. Sounds good to me. I look okay. forward to it. All right, all the best, everybody. Uh, all of everything we're talking about and link to what uh, Aubrey's up to because we didn't even talk to Audrey, Aubrey about about all the different things that he's involved with, and and there's uh, some things that some of you out there might be interested on it. It's called. And mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have a link there. And um, and we'll do this again, Aubrey. Let's do it again. I look forward to it. Yeah, and the Aubrey Marcus podcast is another place where people yes, can uh, check out. Yes, of course. That's very first. And that, that, that'll all be again on the show notes and, and people you'll be able to just link up to everything. We'll see you next week on Mind Rolling. 